And I got this morning just really excited, you know, about my lesson, excited about the Lord, and just excited about worship, which it's, I love. I love worship. That's my favorite time. Anyway, I just want to give you all a little bit of something to think about. If you think about, you know, back in Genesis, and you think about back um, when Adam was created, and you think about before sin. So, you know, there was fellowship with Adam and God, and before sin, you know, nothing died. So you have to remember that too. So, what was Adam doing in the garden? You know, he wasn't raking leaves. He wasn't, you know, just cutting things down. He wasn't doing anything because sin hadn't entered the world, so nothing was dying. So what was he doing? <coughs> he was worshiping God. <laughs> that was his main job. That was his only job at that time was to worship the Lord. You know, so as we go to worship today, I want y'all to think about that. Maybe give a couple of extra hoo hoo. You know what I mean? Because that is our job. And not that the not that we're not called to prayer. We're not called to do all that, but you know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallow, hallow, worship. You know what I mean? We are to worship him first and pump ourselves up and give ourselves in his presence and in his glory. So anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. And we all said, woo woo. <laughs> Please bow with me as we pray. Dear Lord, we come to you today so grateful for the sunshine. What a wonderful thing it does for our attitudes. Lord, we have so many things to pray about. And I ask, Lord, that you go through each pew and each person here, Lord. Please be with them, be with their concerns, their praises, things that they need to pray about, Lord. We ask that you touch them and let them know that they can come to you with anything. We ask, Lord, that you be with Pastor and Susan as they get ready for the next adventure. And Lord, we ask that you be in prayer. Help us to be in prayer for um, the person that you've already chosen for us to have as the next pastor. Lord, it takes a lot of prayer and each one of us needs to be praying every day about this. It doesn't have to be a long prayer, but Lord, we need to be seeking you for the decisions ahead. We ask, Lord, that you be with all those that need a healing touch, um, a relationship touch, a financial touch. We ask that you be with our country, Lord, as it is a, it's a mess. And we, Lord, Lord, we ask that you help us to stay strong in our faith and, and strong with our relationship with you. We just thank you, Lord, for all your many blessings, those we see and those we don't see. In your name we pray, amen. amen. All right, all those who are going to join the church this morning, would you please stand in front, please? have an association together in the Church of Jesus Christ are very sacred and precious. As I said last week, the church cannot save us, but the church is so vital in, in uh, providing for us the things that we need to do and know about being a Christian. There isn't in it such hallowed fellowship as cannot otherwise be known. There is such helpfulness with brotherly watch, care, and counsel as can only be found in the church. And I'd like to add, there's many today who feels like the church is not necessary. The church is very necessary. There is the godly care of pastors with the teachings of the word and the helpful inspiration of corporate worship. 
There is cooperation in service accomplishing that which cannot otherwise be done. The doctrines upon which the church rests as essential to Christian experience are brief. We believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We especially emphasize the deity of Jesus Christ and the personality of the Holy Spirit. We believe that human beings are born in sin, that they need the work of forgiveness through Christ and a new birth by the Holy Spirit. That subsequent to this, there's a deeper work of heart cleansing or entire sanctification through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And that to each of these works of grace, the Holy Spirit gives witness. We believe that our Lord will return, the dead shall be raised, and that all shall come to final judgment with its rewards and punishments. Do you hardly believe these truths? If so, answer, I do. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And do you realize that he saves you now? Very good. Desiring to unite with the Church of the Nazarene, do you covenant to give yourself to the fellowship and work of God in connection with it? Will you endeavor in every way to glorify God by a humble walk, godly conversation, and holy service, by devoting the devoted of your means, by faithful attendance upon the means of grace, and abstaining from evil, when you seek earnestly to perfect holiness of heart and life, and the fear of the Lord. If so, answer, I will. I want to be the first to welcome you into the Church of the Nazarene, Mary at the Church of the Nazarene. Well, good morning. good morning. So good to see you all. Look at these smiling faces. And we're going to praise the Lord this morning. In Hebrews 12, 28, Therefore, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably, acceptably, and with reverence and awe. For God is a consuming fire. If you would, please stand at this time. We're going to worship. There's a line in here that I really love. It says, change the atmosphere. And um, just help us, Lord, as we praise you this morning. Come set you rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray.
God, we do need you in our hearts, our minds. Lord, I come.
like to come and pray at this time. We sing this last song. The breath of God, the Spirit of God, breathe on you, Lord. Breathe on us, your breath. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew. I may love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God. Until and passing over transgression for the remnant of your inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Let us pray this morning. Well, good morning, church. How are you? Well, I was up until past 1 a.m. last night uh, because for some reason the teens in our youth group liked me enough to invite me to Winter Jam with them. So as you can see, they're all pretending to be asleep right now. <laughs> but I told them if they weren't in church this morning, I'd make them look really bad because I had to do this. If you would turn with me to um, the book of 1 Samuel, that's where we'll be this morning. I'm going to begin reading at um, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of, the God had not, the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called to Samuel and he said, Here I am. And ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called to me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. And so he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel rose, arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the word of the Lord was not yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him, that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. 
Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What is it that he has told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he has told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet to the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh. By the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord to us this morning, would you pray with me? Jesus, what a blessing it is for you to enter this space through your word to us today. And so we pray that you would open some hearts tonight, uh, this morning rather, that you would speak to us with wisdom and in truth. Amen. Well, suppose you were on a busy street in New York City, and a Japanese man walks up to you and he says, Excuse me, sir, can you tell me the name of this block? You say, oh, well, that's, that's easy. This is 1st Street, and that's 2nd Street. This is Washington Avenue. That's Franklin Lane. The Japanese man, he's a little bit confused, and he says, no, but what is the name of this block? And you say, oh, I'm not sure what you mean. Blocks don't have names. Streets have names. Blocks are just the empty spaces in between. Now, suppose that same American man was on a street corner in Japan, and he walked up to a Japanese man and he said, Excuse me, sir, can you tell me the name of this street? And the Japanese man says, Oh, that's easy. This is the first block, and this is second block. This is eighth block and ninth block. And you look at him a little bit confused, and you say, Wait, I, I don't understand, but what's the name of the street? And the Japanese man looks a little confused and says, well, streets don't have names. Blocks have names. Streets are just the empty spaces in between. Have you ever had a trouble or difficulty seeing something differently than the way you've always seen it? I want to share with you a story that I found a couple decades ago um, online in the news. In 1963, Michael May lost his eyesight to a chemical explosion at the age of three. The doctors quickly determined that the chemical damage to his eyes was permanent and that he would learn, have to learn to live as a, a legally blind man. Now, because he was so young, three years old, he didn't actually have a very developed memory of what life was like with vision. And so he didn't really, growing up, Seem, remember what life was like with vision, what, what he would have lost, essentially. And so like many, he learned to be self-sufficient as a blind man in the world. You know, he learned braille, he learned to walk with a cane, etc. Um, he even actually became a very talented snow skier. And he lived this way for more than 40 years, not letting his disability inhibit him from having a very successful life. But in 2003, Stem cell research had made it surgically possible for Michael's vision to be restored. And so at the age of 43, Michael May was able to see again for the first time. Hear his words on the day he regained his sight. He said, taking off the bandages was a very new vista. The first thing I saw was a whoosh of white and black instruments in the exam room and of my wife. But even after seeing her face and the faces of my sons, I couldn't recognize them. Michael's doctor, doctor quickly explained to him that this was because of his prolonged blindness, 
the visual pathways in his brain had died. Distinguishing the differences between human faces was as difficult to Michael as it would be for us trying to distinguish the differences between sheep. For him, they all looked the same. Even three years following his surgery, Michael explains that he still needs a cane to walk around because his brain isn't able to trust his eyes. He's even become a worse skier after regaining his vision. The information became a distraction, he said. My brain learned to trust my body, but it did not know how to trust my eyes. You see, Michael had been blind for so long that his body didn't know how to process to understand the world in any other way than as a blind man even with restored vision. Have you ever considered that perhaps the body of Christ has done this to itself? What if perhaps our vision of, of Christian interaction and mission within the world and all that our faith in Christ entails what if we looked at it in such a narrow way for so long that we can't seem to interact with the world in any other way? We essentially have blinded ourselves by our own vision. Let me ask you, let me ask you that in a different way. As a Christian, how would you continue to walk and to grow in Christ and in faith with God if perhaps... The notion of a church like this was an impossibility. Or how would you continue to walk with Christ if sermons were not a part of worship at all? If, if there was never anyone boldly declaring the word of the Lord to you? Or how would you continue to grow as a believer and a follower if there was zero possibility of, of corporate mass, mass worship in any sense? Have you ever thought about those questions? What if we couldn't do this? What would I do? How would I grow with Christ? The reason these questions may seem hard to answer for us is because on some level, we've accepted this idea that this is how God does ministry. Like Michael May, perhaps, we've learned to trust one specific model, one specific vision so much that even if a new idea, a new way of looking at things is presented, it's challenging for us to change, to think differently. This morning I want to talk to you about our propensity to lack vision. Whether you notice it or not, every single one of us develops our own habits, our own ways of doing things. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The problem is when our own vision becomes so ingrained, so, so built into us, that it prevents us from seeing things differently. Let me give you an example. When I was a child, my mother had a very specific rule about the transition of Thanksgiving into the Christmas season. Right? The tree was not allowed to go up until after Thanksgiving was over. Right? So Black Friday was tree decoration day. That's how it always was. And as a child, she would often say, Matthew, would you like to help me decorate the tree? And of course, you know, when I'm a youngster, I said yes. You know? But here's how that process went. I would go over to the box, grab an ornament that I liked, and I would take it over, walk over to the tree, hang it up on the tree, and then turn my back to go get another ornament. And when I found the other ornament, I would turn my back, and the ornament I had just placed was moved. <laughs> Does this sound familiar to anyone? Right? Right. So I quickly learned that me helping decorate the tree actually didn't, didn't change the way my mother saw the tree. She had this specific vision of how this tree was supposed to be decorated. And yes, I could help move ornaments from here to the tree, but she was going to put them where they needed to go. 
right? You see, my mother had this, this specific vision of what that Christmas tree was supposed to look like. And my vision wasn't the same as hers. Now, there's no problem with that, but the problem was that my mother wasn't able to see the tree in any other way. I think we have a tendency to do this with God. You see, if history shows us anything, it's that God has specific times when he desires to do ministry in a specific way. But like a mother who cannot see a Christmas tree differently, we often are so blinded by our own vision of ministry, how God has worked in our own lives, that we cannot see the vision God may have for the church. We only see our own. And so what I want you to consider this morning is what if perhaps how we see ministry or how I see ministry is no longer how God sees it. What if my own vision of the church and of the gospel and of, and of Christ and how we engage the world is not, it's not congruent with what God wants to do or rather, how God wants to do it. And I think in order to answer a question like that, we need to look to the scriptures. In this instance, I think 1 Samuel chapter 3 gives us a very compelling argument. Upon this point in Israel's history, God has led his people through two unique leadership positions. The high priest and the judge. The high priest was designated to represent the people to God. It was his responsibility to maintain the tent of meeting in the wilderness, this kind of mobile church that they had for the, the people of Israel. And also his responsibility when they erected permanent temples once they made it to the promised land in Canaan. And his greatest responsibility, the high priest, was that once a year he had to enter into the Holy of Holies, you know, that giant thick thick room full of the goat hair curtain, right, the curtain that was torn in two. He had to enter into that room where God dwelled and offer a sacrifice for the people, right? Slay a bull or a sheep or something along those lines, right, to cover the sins of the people for the year. And this was such a big deal because in that time, if, if the high priest wasn't spiritually clean in every single way, the moment he stepped into the Holy of Holies, he would be struck dead. And so, in fact, one of the typical things they would do is they would tie a rope around one of his feet. And so, if it had been a couple hours since he came out, they were like, he's probably dead, and they'd have to drag him out of the Holy of Holies. It was a very big deal to be the high priest of Israel. Now, as you know, Moses was the first leader of Israel, right? Through, uh, God used him to bring his people out of slavery in Egypt. And it was followed by Joshua at the time of Moses' death. And Joshua helped lead the people into the promised land. But after Joshua died, God stipulated that Israel was not to have a king like the other nations. And so God established these, these men and women called judges to rule over Israel. Now, these men and women, they, they were called to serve as leaders of the people, but not in the typical sense of like a king or a president or something, because they did not receive the perks of authority that comes with monarchy, right? They didn't collect taxes from the people. They didn't get giant mansions to live in and conduct their business from. They were merely ordained, called upon by God to lead the people for a time. Yahweh did this because he was to be their king. And the judge was his representative. In the book of 1 Samuel, however, it marks a big shift in the life of Israel. Because this is the beginning of the story of Israel's age of monarchy. Kings, Saul, David, Solomon, and the like. 1 Samuel marks the time when the judge's reign is over. 
as we attempt to address this, this issue of, of a limited vision and what that can have upon our, our faith life, we're going to need to take a very specific historical and theological look at the passage in the story of Samuel, especially because it's in this age of transition when we're moving away from Judges and into this, this beginning of the age of Kings. And so hopefully as I begin to draw out some of these theological and historical themes from the text this morning, you'll be able to make some similar connections to your own visions and how they may or may not be congruent with God's. How many of you are familiar with the story of Samuel-ish? For those of you who aren't, let me, let me just briefly fill you in. Chapter 1 tells the story of a man named Elkanah, and he has two wives. One is named Panina, and the other's name is Hannah. As the story explains, Panina provided Elkanah with all of his children, but Hannah was barren. Now, regardless of this fact, Elkanah's true love, the wife he loved the most, was Hannah. And he showed this to her in, in various ways, even though she could bear him no child. This caused immense jealousy for, for Penina, who used Hannah's barrenness to constantly humiliate her. And so Hannah, in her suffering, asked God to provide her a child, and if he would be so faithful, upon the time when the child was weaned, she would give him to the Lord. Well, God heard Hannah's prayer, and she gave birth to a son, which she named Samuel. And as she said, when Samuel became of age and was weaned, she brought him up to the temple mount of Shiloh, this, this permanent temple where Israel was at the time, and gave him into the foster care of Eli, the high priest, so that he could be given to the Lord. Chapter 3 picks up in his early childhood, probably around when he was 8 to 10 years old. We'll begin reading at verse 1 again. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again Samuel, and Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he rose and went, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Let's pause here. In these first nine verses, the author paints a picture of an increasingly disparity between Samuel and Eli's position. The passage begins with two incredibly conflicting points. Verse 1 describes for us a period within the life of, the, of Israel in which God is not speaking. The text says there was rarely a vision from God. Imagine if all across the world next Sunday morning when the pastors entered the pulpit, they all said, God didn't say anything to me this week. And then imagine that had drug on for months. It's kind of a tough situation. It doesn't certainly sound like a great time, does it? This duty would have fallen to the high priest and those in his family lineage serving with him. However, it seems that God is not speaking 
to Eli any longer or any member of his family. Yet in the midst of this quiet age, verse 1 declares that Samuel, who is still a young boy, is ministering to the Lord. For whatever reason, God is beginning to shift this, this priestly and prophetic authority away from Eli and over to Samuel. And as we read further, the text explains why. When we get to the next few verses, we learn that Eli's eyes had grown dim so that he could not see. This phrasing is an intentional Hebrew wordplay. The author is actually making a twofold statement. Not only has Eli's eyes begun to fail him in his old age physically, but he has now grown dim also to seeing and recognizing the word of the Lord. Eli's physical and spiritual vision has begun to fail him. And we see this emphasized even further through the fact that it takes Eli three times to recognize that God is speaking to Samuel. And to make this disparity between Samuel and Eli even greater, the author notes that Eli was laying down in his own place, while Samuel was in the temple where the Ark of God was. If you are unaware, the Ark of the Lord is, it was the chest crafted to hold the, the tablets where Moses wrote the Ten Commandments upon But more importantly, the lid of the Ark was referred to as the mercy seat. And it functioned as this kind of pseudo-earthly throne for God. And so the author, the author is drawing this, this clear distinction to the reality that, that Samuel is currently in the presence of God, but Eli is not. The clear indication from Scripture is that, that God is about to make a, a, a shift in leadership. And with every passing day, God seems to be drawing closer to Samuel and further and further away from Eli. All right, Pastor Matthew, thanks for the history lesson, but what does any of this have to do with limited vision and what you really were supposed to talk about? Great question. The first section actually helps us to see the dangers of going too far in the opposite direction. Take a look again at verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. You see, up until this point, Samuel had a limited vision of God because he did not know him or hear him speak yet. It's not, that Samuel, it's not that Samuel had such an ingrained vision of God that he couldn't see God any other way. Rather, it's because he was ignorant of God that he could not recognize him. Until Eli recognized that, that God was calling the boy, Samuel had no way of recognizing that he was hearing God's voice. Have you ever considered in your own personal reflection with Christ, in your, your devotional time or, or, or whatever you set aside to be with God, that if you are unaware, that, that you find yourself becoming increasingly unaware of God, hearing God's voice. That you may enter into a season of your life when it's really hard to, to, to hear God speaking to you. I'm sure we've all been there. In, this, in discussing these dangers of, of being too certain about our vision of God, it's just as dangerous to be too uncertain. In discerning the voice and the will of God, there's this delicate balance between confidence and humility that must be found. And perhaps like Samuel, if, if you believe yourself not confident enough that you can hear the voice of God, you need to seek out some spiritual leadership for help. Even as Eli's wisdom and ability begins to fade, he is the reason that Samuel is able to recognize the voice of God. And you see, this is exactly the reason why the church is called to be this multi-generational, multi-faceted, diverse group of believers. 
Because each one of us can lend something to the other that we desperately need. And so I'll tell you the truth, as Christians, and especially you young ones, you need seasoned spiritual leadership to help support you into God. And so church, I want to encourage you this morning that just as, just as too firm of a vision can limit us, so can too weak of one. And so if you are wise in the ways of God, find someone who is still learning and help them. And if you are young in Christ, find someone who has spent a lifetime with him and ask them for support. That is so foundational for a church. That is how we grow in quality with Christ, and we need that. Or else who is going to be able to discern the voice of the Lord? Amen. Let's continue reading the first time. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Let's pause once more. <clears throat> There's one very specific detail about the high priesthood that I left out. Not everyone in Israel was allowed to be the high priest. In fact, back, way back to the days of Moses, God made a very clear mandate that the only people who were to serve as high priest over Israel were the offspring of Aaron, Moses' brother. This is a family tradition that is passed down from generation to generation. And so if you actually look at the lineage, Eli is Aaron's grandson. This is important for two reasons. The first is Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas. As God tells Samuel here, Hophni and Phinehas are wicked men who blasphemed God. Let me give you some more details. In chapter 2, the author describes Hophni and Phinehas as worthless. For starters, verses 22 through 26 explain that both Hophni and Phinehas regularly engaged in sexually illicit activity within the sanctuary at Shiloh, the place where the Ark of God is and subsequently in his presence. Moreover, the verbal syntax in verse 22 mentioning that the sons <coughs> laid with women is sakav et in Hebrew. This is incredibly similar to Hebrew instances throughout the Old Testament that refer to rape and other forms of sexual abuse. Yeah. Additionally, the sacrificial meat offered to Yahweh had a very specific cooking process to determine what share belonged to God and what shares were given to the priests so that they could survive. To make a long story short, Hophni and Phinehas neglected these rules in order that they could have the best cuts of meat and gorge themselves on all the things that people offered to God. Essentially, they robbed God of their offering. So this would be akin to Terry or I reaching into the collection plate every morning and taking a hundred bucks out. Not cool. Essentially, Hophni and Phinehas treated God with contempt. And so considering that the high priesthood was designated for this one specific family, at some point, when Eli could no longer fulfill his duties as high priest, guess who takes over? Hophni or Phinehas. Could you imagine someone like Hophni and Phinehas as the Pope, let alone the pastor of a church? The second reason 
that this is in a crucial detail, this, this family lineage uh, of the high priesthood, is because God reveals to us that he is willing to change his mind. For decades prior, God has led his people through the high priesthood designated for Aaron's bloodline. That was God's explicit choice to do back in the days of Moses. This was how he chose to minister to the people of Israel. Now, on the night that he speaks to Samuel for the first time, God declares that their leadership is over. We are done with this model. I am going to cut Eli and his lineage off completely. Let me explain to you how big of a deal that is. <clears throat> if you were Eli, all your life you would have heard that this is our family's duty to serve God as high priest. He probably sat in his father's house and heard him say, My father Aaron was high priest, and one day you will take my place as high priest also, Eli. This is how Eli understood God to work. It was his job, it was his duty, and God's will to work through his family. This was the rhetoric of ministry that he had always seen, always known for the entirety of his life. Like my mother, Eli saw one specific vision of how that tree was supposed to be decorated. One vision of how God actualized himself into the lives of Israel. And how God ministered to the people. So upon hearing what God proclaimed to Eli, it should only be expected that his natural response would be something like, No way, God. You can't do ministry that way. You can't cut off my family. You can't put ornaments on the tree in that way. The tree's not supposed to look like that. That's not how you work. That's not how you do ministry. But the question is, though, is that what Eli says? Let's finish the passage. Verse 15. Samuel lay until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet to the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh. By the word of the Lord, amen. I am fascinated by Eli because of this response. It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. After hearing God condemn his offspring for their wickedness and to vow to punish Eli himself for not disciplining his children, Eli says to God, So be it. Your will be done. Imagine if God suddenly shouted out to us today and said, Hey, you know this whole, this whole Sunday service, sermon and singing, church building, board thing you guys have been doing for over a century? I'm done with that. I want to do ministry differently. I'm going to do ministry differently going forward. If you heard God say something like that, perhaps... What do you think your response would be to him? Would you be humble enough, like Eli, to say, you do as you see fit, Don? 
your vision is better than mine. Or would your knee-jerk be a jerk reaction be to say, no. No, God, that's not right. You can't take away these things because this is how I do ministry. This is how we do ministry. This is how you do ministry, God. You see, I think all of us, some days more than others, have a tendency to hold on to things simply because it's what we know. It's what we've learned. It's what comes natural to us. But the danger comes when those things become so built into our minds, so ingrained within us, that we lose sight of the purpose in favor of the process. Instead of recognizing that it's God's desire to make disciples and then yielding to how God wants to make them, we sometimes are too quick to say that God's desire is to make disciples my way. God's desire is to make disciples how I see disciples being made. And when we do this, and we don't even sometimes recognize that we do this, but when we do this, we change the line in the Lord's Prayer from thy kingdom come to the, and thy will be done to thy kingdom come but my will be done. I want your kingdom here, God. I want to build your kingdom here, but I want to do it my way. I'm going to build the church my way. I know with confidence that all of us have a, have a deep desire to build the church, to proclaim the gospel, to make disciples of all nations to whoever would hear the truth of God. But we must be careful that we do not grow accustomed to our own vision so much that it prevents us from seeing God. And in order to do that, we need to be humble enough to consider how God might want to work differently than we wanted to. This morning, I invite you into humble reflection with God. And I assure you, my brothers and sisters, if you are willing to lay down your own bias just enough and to consider God what do you want us to do? How do you want us to do it? <coughs> I tell you, he is more than willing to share his vision with you. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, you are our Lord. But the reality is that sometimes our habitual nature convinces us that what we like to do and how we like to do it is what you want us to do and how you want us to do it. And that is not always the case. And so Jesus, today we take a humble audit of our hearts and, and we say, God, what am I holding on to? What, what is it that I love that, that, that I, I, I think is necessary to serve you and to proclaim your, proclaim your gospel that you might be saying, you know, it's time to let this go. It's time to think about this differently. Instead of looking at the world as if streets have names and blocks do not, maybe switch it around. Just take a step back and watch me decorate the tree. So Jesus, in this, in this moment, would you speak just for a few seconds to our hearts today?
God, our prayer is truly that your kingdom would come. But would you remind us this morning that that is only achieved through your will, not our own. And so we pray this morning, not just that your kingdom would come, but that your will would be done through us how you would be fit to do. Jesus, you are a God who restores, a God who is continually restoring, and you have done so many great things, and we know that there are greater things that are still to come. So break down some of our walls, some of our preconceived notions, and and show us just exactly what you have in store. In your name we pray this morning. Amen. Ha, ha, ha.